Welcome back to part two of my chat with high profile private eye Ken Gamble. Hey, Ken, I said at the start, I wouldn't want you chasing me. <laughs> and the more I've listened to your stories, if I do go missing, you can come looking for me. Absolutely. If, uh, if I don't want to be missing, if I've been taken, I want you uh, coming looking for me. But uh, I've got to describe you like a dog with a bone on on the cases that you work on. It's once you've uh, you got your teeth into them, you don't let go. Yeah, and I think you have to when, when you're working for people that are paying you to do a job, you want to do the best you can. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. it's an attribute, and I, I see it as a, a detective through my career in the New South Wales Police. You need that tenacity. Like, there's a lot of cases that it's like tracking an elephant through the snow, and every, everyone can uh, you know, sol- solve them. It's the difficult ones. That's when your skills really come into play. And Absolutely. You, you've got to... Yeah. And there's more setbacks and uh, yeah, rewards sometimes and mm. the long protracted inquiries. But when I was, and I just want to talk about the attributes of a good uh, investigator, whether it be a detective or a pri- private eye. And there's a couple of quotes that uh, I, I picked up when I was uh, researching before I spoke to you, quoted by a very well-known private uh, investigator, Ken Gamble. <laughs> this is your quote, so don't, don't be critical of it. But uh, I just want you to uh, talk what you mean by it. Experience counts for everything as an investigator. Sometimes we would wait for a day for a subject to move and then lose them in 30 seconds. I don't enjoy working on a case and not getting a successful result for a client. I've always been results driven. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's, uh, that's pretty spot on. Yeah. Um, a, 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 again, because um, you're, you're, you're paid to do a job, you want to do the best for your client. Um, and there's a lot of patience involved in in what we do and 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 I, I guess if you've got a determined personality so someone that's very determined to get results well then you'll probably be good at this job yeah. um, you know because I, I I hate failure I hate um, spending a long time on something and not 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 achieving the result or, or reaching the goal yeah. Um, so I always um, strive to do my very best at what, whatever it was that I was looking into and learning all the relevant skills that would make me better and better next time. Because I've there's been lots of failures. I mean, yeah. I, no one becomes good at what they do. But you learn failures. learn by your failures. Or, or if you've got an open mind to it, you should that, That's how you learn. I, yeah. I think that without um, failures, we can't be successful really. Yeah. And, and staying ahead of the game, which is clearly what you've done throughout your career because knowledge is power, isn't it? If Absolutely. You... And you have to evolve with the, the way the world evolves. Yeah. Um, in this industry, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit cutthroat as well. There's a lot of investigation agencies out there. A lot of people come in with very high credentials yep. um, thinking they're going to you know, take over the industry and... There's a, there's a lot of competition. Um, I always wanted to stay ahead of all of that by doing things that would be in a niche area, Yeah. Um, which is what we've managed to do um, to this day. Yeah. Um, another another quote, and uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about this, but uh, quoted from uh, something that you've said. My ability to serve others and offer my skills to those who need these types of service has been a major driving force in my work. I love the feeling of getting results, whether it be catching a fraudster, solving a missing person case, or tracking an international fugitive. It's a a quote from you. A a couple of things there that clearly you do have empathy for the people you're working for. And it's almost like I've got this, I've got this skills. I want to help you, and mm. then you're going in there helping people, and and it's a double-edged sword. Quite often, I've been criticised for being passionate or taking it personal, but I, I say that that's okay as long as you do it with um, perspective. Mm. What you've said there, what would you mean by that? Expanding on that. Well, um, whatever I take on, um, I, I'm going to do my very best at. Yeah. Um, Whatever it is, and and it, it it shows the diversity in what we do as investigators. You you can be doing a lot of very diverse things, um, and and a lot of diverse cases, um, and uh, whatever whatever task or case I'm undertaking, I want to I want to pursue that to the end, yeah. um, in order to get the the appropriate results, and that's always the way I've been. You've uh, with the company that you've got now. Um, IFW Global. Yes, correct. Um, 
Tell me about the skill sets of people that you've got in your company. We touched on it in the first first part, but I just want to go into more detail. Like a, an investigation, what's a, what do you consider a good investigative team? Yeah, well, we, we have a, a whole variety of people, and IFW Global is um, a, a private investigation agency, but also more of, a, of an international intelligence firm, a private intelligence firm, because the private intelligence business is a lot of work we do is intelligence based. Yep. Um, not always just gathering evidence. We we do a lot of intelligence work. So, uh, and we specialise in in the field of cyber crime um, and in the field of uh, large scale financial crime. Yep. Um, across the world uh, and also asset recovery for victims. So, that type of skill set requires uh, professionals with with different skills and everything from we've got. Um, cyber investigators that are trained cyber investigators with degrees in computer science or cyber security. Um, we have a forensic team that does all the forensic type work, um, mainly internet forensics or website forensics. So that is getting in behind the digital trail, behind left, uh, you know, within websites, within even getting into the source code, the technical source code, and investigating. The source code of and, and and the, these type of type of people, which you know, in a team twenty years ago, wouldn't you, you wouldn't think they'd be part of a uh, private investigative team, but these these could be the nerds, or uh, yeah, you know, the, these people that have grown up using computers, understand it, live it, and breathe it. They're the type of Absolutely. people that and, you want on that. And the in-house staff, you know, of course, as a business, you have to have your administration people, your yep. your, your sales people. Um, your financial people, your, your accounts, all of that. It's a business. So yep. we have to have um, the, the the team, the support team. Um, yep. But the technical team have a, a, a variety of different skills. We have a covert engagement team. Yep. Um, and they covertly engage with people to track them. Um, and and some of those people, they're, they're risk takers by nature. They're, they've got to, and I, I think we could have described you in your early days. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes, how, oh, I don't care to know how you got that picture, but uh, yeah, they've got to uh, roll the dice sometimes. Absolutely. And, 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 and then we have our external teams uh, who are our surveillance teams. They're the operatives in the field. Yep. And they can come from all backgrounds, military, uh, former intelligence, former law enforcement. Uh, we, we've got a, an incredible array of um, ex-professionals yeah. um, who have worked in the investigative or intelligence uh, or even security industry that have um, certain skill sets. Yep. Um, we've used a lot of former special forces people to do operations in uh, foreign countries, for example, yeah. like Borneo and Cambodia and Europe and the Middle East. Um, so there's contracted. a risk associated with it, the, the risk factor in some of those countries. I would Absolutely. Imagine. Yeah, we've had clients who have had death threats and they're traveling to a, a, a very dangerous country. Yep. Um, and we'll we'll arm that client with all of the resources that he needs, and that might be uh, you know some former uh, special forces uh, guys who are now working in private security. Yep. Um, and we'll put them in there because they've done this in Afghanistan or Iraq, yeah. and you know, we we always bring the appropriate skill set in to whatever the job may be. Um, and our surveillance operations around the world have have, have spread all over the planet. Um, from the North Korean border uh, to Africa, North Africa, all over Europe, we've done you know surveillance in we've lost count of how many countries we've done covert work in. But in all those places, we need people. Uh, we need um, a driver. Yeah. We need um, a local surveillance people. We need someone really knowledgeable about the the area. We need someone in security to be looking after our backs yeah. when we're on those jobs. So walking into our office is no different to um, walking into any major law enforcement agency's cybercrime division and seeing a bunch of a bunch of guys um, and girls yep. uh, on on computers and pulling records, uh, getting into databases, creating I two charts on a big screen, um, examining data, uh, doing data analysis. All of that high tech stuff is is a daily function. For IFW Global, yeah, um, and and it's 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 a it's a great. Uh, only recently have we been able to get the team back together because of COVID. 
uh, we're all working remotely and it's difficult to do ca- certain casework yeah. when everyone's remote. It doesn't have that same synergy, does it? No. If you, you haven't got people bouncing ideas off. Off each other, right? no, that's it. And I, I like the idea of a teamwork. I like, I like when we're working on a case. I love everyone to be working on that case at the same time, if possible. Yep. Um, and I like collaborating as a team. And we've only just started to do that again, yeah. um, you know, post COVID. Uh, and it's exciting. I've already done my first trip to the Philippines. Uh, about to go back very soon. Yep. Uh, I've got operations coming up in, uh, in in a number of other Southeast Asian countries. I, I think one of the, uh, I mentioned it very briefly before, but one of the uh, first times I became aware of the work that you've done was, um, it was a 60 minute story. Um, there was a call centre um, uh, in the Philippines where you, uh, you went in with the crew and uh, just showed that you could track uh, track people down. Now these were the fraudsters that were um, they were multinational, but based in the Philippines, but targeting Australian. Yeah, and that's been a common problem for the last twenty years. Yeah, um, and I wanted to, uh, I guess, I wanted to prove uh, to not only our law enforcement agencies here, but also the general public, that these people can be caught. Yeah, because there's this illusion. Um, and, and it's incorrect um, that these people in foreign countries can never be found, and you'll never get your money back. That's yeah. that's the general. I, I've got lots of statements from serving police officers telling people that the money's gone. You'll never get it back. Um, there's no point pursuing it. Well, that I, I yeah. think is is just a lie. I mean, it's it's so wrong. Um, we've taken tens of millions of dollars off foreign criminals. Yeah. Um, by seizing their accounts, by tracking them, it is absolutely possible. And the reason I, I did that show is is to um, to show that it can be done. Um, and if I can do it individually by myself, yeah. then I'm sure our law enforcement agencies could I, do I, the same thing. <laughs> I, I remember sitting there watching it, and I was embarrassed to be a police officer. In that I'm thinking. We should be doing this. What's uh, what? Are, what are you doing? But uh, we understand, and we've had this conversation that yeah, police are we're jurisdictional and uh, hold it doesn't impact on us. But I do feel sorry for people that have been ripped off in elaborate frauds. And uh, yeah, these these are con men targeting multiple people, and the uh, occasionally they'll get a hit. But that particular story that we're talking about, people are losing their life savings. Absolutely, and it, it, it is the most, the financial crime against uh, mums and dads of Australia is the most devastating type of crime of all. Because and, uh, sorry to win her up, but that was it was a cold uh, cold call, wasn't it? They were just phoning people up and yeah. then talking uh, talking them into uh, investing. And the only people they get on the hook are, are decent, hardworking, honest people, because those honest people could never imagine that someone would. Pull off such an elaborate investment scam, yeah, like that, and everything looks so real. They they use fake names. They you know they yeah they purport to be hotshot brokers, and it, it you can you can understand why people get convinced. Um, but you know, targeting someone's financial savings, uh, their superannuation, um, is is a horrible crime because you're robbing them of their dreams, everything they've saved for. Uh, we've had clients who have spent 30 years uh, working, just retired, put their money into what they believed was a legitimate superannuation fund, yeah, and or rolled it over into a super fund, and it's gone. It was a, it, yeah, a result of a, of a fraud. It's gone uh, in a matter of minutes or hours. The money's gone. Um, and and the worst part about these crimes is that there is no um, there's no help. From yeah. anyone, they've got nowhere to turn to. Well, I, the the amount of calls I get from people saying, "Look, we've got this fraud situation." This is since I've been out of the cops, but even when I was in the cops, and uh, we've gone into the police station, they said, "Oh no, it's a civil matter." And I, I've looked at it and think, "Well, I don't really think it's a civil matter. There's been some criminality there. Obtain a benefit by deception at the very least." Mm. Um, but they're stuck, and then even if the police are engaged in it and follow it up, it's just for criminal. Process. It's not about retrieving the money. Correct. That's right, and that's that's sad, really, yeah. um, because it should be all about uh, seizing assets. These are criminals. They're they're, they're organised criminal syndicates. Um, their assets should be frozen. Um, you know, 
it, it's 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 quite easy for their assets to be frozen when governments get together. Yeah. But it's very hard um, in some Southeast Asian countries because there are police in these countries that don't want to work with Australians or Americans. Um, it's all about relationships. Uh, yeah. So I I always uh, believe that that the the New South Wales Police and other state police should should engage more um, with international partners uh, to learn about what's going on out, outside of Australia um, yeah. and learn how these crime trends are growing. Because now, with, with the amount of cyber crime that's, that's on the planet and crypto crime hit $14 billion, last, uh, $14 billion of losses last year alone, um, that's recorded cases, gr- grossly underestimated of what's really been lost. Yeah. Um, the the line between criminality and legitimacy is now so blurred that that even law enforcement can't tell the difference. Um, the, the average punter can't tell the difference between something that's a scam or something that's real, and that's the perfect crime. Yeah. If you have create an illusion, whether it's a crypto exchange or a trading platform or something that looks really, really legitimate, um, uh, it's 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 disguised. Um, it, it's it's actually disguised to make a lot of money, um, looking because of its legitimacy. But in reality, it's operated by criminals. It's built by criminals. It's manipulated by criminals. Um, and behind these websites are gangs of hundreds and hundreds. In one case in the Philippines, a thousand people mm. behind these websites making up to one million US dollars per day in and, income. And what what you're saying and what you demonstrated on that uh, that case that was covered on the uh, sixty minutes is that they can be brought down, but there needs to be a will to do it. There's got to be uh, a, a will. Um, there's got to be. Um, the resources to do it. Yeah, well, that's true. The relationships, yep. foreign partners, all of that. And why can't we extradite these people? Why don't we extradite people that commit crimes against Australians? Yeah. This is a big issue. The Americans will extradite from anywhere in the world. I work with the Americans, the FBI, HSI. I work very closely with them. Uh, we've done recent arrests in the last six months um, yep. in, in Cyprus and other countries. They extradite. Anyone that commits violations of well, US what, law. What you've just said there makes me think that uh, we're all getting these calls, for these annoying calls, because we're a soft target. Because uh, The softest target in the world. We're, we're on the top number one on the suckers list <laughs> all over the world. I, I've been in, you know, I've spoken to sources in Eastern Europe, yeah. uh, in, 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 in Africa, in, all over Southeast Asia. Um, the people that we've arrested. Um, I've recorded interviews with people yep. saying uh, we go for Australia because Australia is the easiest place to make money. Yeah. Because number one, it's a very you know wealthy country. We've people have super. People yep. have got money. Number two, nobody ever comes after us. Yeah. So that's very yeah, concerning. Isn't very it? concerning. And, yeah. and I, I think um, we should adopt uh, a similar extradition laws. We probably have them if, yeah. you, if you really want to get into the nitty-gritty, but we should be able to extradite these criminals that perpetrate a, a serious crime against an Australian from overseas, doesn't matter where they yeah. are, it's, it's, they're using the internet, they're targeting yeah. an Australian, the Australian suffers massive financial loss, yeah. millions of dollars of losses. Um, that criminal should be able to be uh, extradited. Well, it, it yeah. would definitely uh, definitely uh, slow the uh, trade down, I would imagine. Do law enforcement agencies, I know overseas uh, law enforcement agencies have engaged you and uh, yeah, work with you. Do you get the same response with Australian law enforcement agencies? Sometimes. Yep. Um, we've had um, very good working relationships with different police. Um, uh, over the years, I've done lots of lo- jobs with hand-in-hand uh, hand with New South Wales Police. Yep. Um, we've provided information that's resulted in arrests. Same with Queensland. Uh, all those boiler rooms that we busted about a decade ago on the Gold Coast, yep. all of that intel came from me right. um, and, and my group. Um, we had about 20 different raids done on the Gold Coast, all from intel that, that was passed on um, by myself as a result of my investigations. So 
um, we have a, a good working relationship. There are, um, it's an individual um, decision of, of any detective, as you would yeah. know, uh, whether or not they want to work with an outside uh, investigator or, or any, outs any outside person, full stop, doesn't yeah. matter what they are. But uh, it's really an individual decision. It depends on the, 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 det the detectives involved, the nature of the case. Um, policing is a very secretive job. It's, it's mm. um, you know, you're bound by a lot of strict procedures. You're bound by the secrecy of all the information that you carry and you've got access to. So it's, it's, it's understandable that, that police will um, not want to open that up to anyone outside of their own um, unit yeah. or their own uh, office or whatever. But in certain cases, particularly cases where families or individuals may retain the services of a professional, yeah, um, and and that case involves criminality of some sort, then the police should, under normal circumstances, at least um, at least have an open open mind or, or open their arms to anyone that's potentially able to come and provide information to them. Yeah. Uh, which could result in prosecutions, or arrests, even intelligence. Um, and and I've had a lot of experience working with uh, good cops and bad cops. Well, I, I think let's call the bad cops for what it is. The ones that uh, if you came to me, if I was working on the investigation and you came to me and uh, said, look, I've got this information, I would embrace that. And I, I think there's an arrogance if, if no, we're the police, you're private, we know what we're doing. There's an arrogance that sometimes can be a barrier to uh, taking uh, taking assistance. Like I, I'm listening to the way that you're approaching investigations. Shout out to uh, to police forces. Get you on the detectives course. Come mm. down and explain what you've uh, you've uncovered because you've been exposed to crime across the globe, not That's just right. in the in the jurisdiction. So yep. I think there's lessons that uh, we we yeah should be taken from what you've learnt from mm. from the uh, experience. Yeah, so. that, that's right, and 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 a lot of it is inexperience within um, within the police. Yeah, you get young detectives who've been in the job for five years. Yeah, they haven't worked with external experts. They have no um, exposure. Um, so someone like us comes and knocks on the door, and you know, although I must admit, a lot of young detectives these days are highly motivated. Yeah, to investigate frauds and um, another case. We're seeing a shift. I'm seeing a shift now with uh, local area commands putting detectives on to fraud cases yeah whereas before they would turn them away well we've got to look at where where fraud's going like banks aren't being held up in the traditional sense of put a balaclava on and saw off a shotgun but uh fraud is going to be organized crime we've got to get ahead of, ahead of the curve for through law enforcement absolutely uh, 10 years ago um there were patched motorcycle outlaw motorcycle gangs uh, running offices on the gold coast yeah doing frauds this is all public information it's a, it's all on the internet um there there that's just a, one example and and i could talk about a lot but they're uh, organized criminal groups whether they're the asian organized crime middle eastern organized crime China, you know, and whatever. The consequences are quite often less for them too if they get caught because they don't get punished as they the way they would if they stuck a shotgun in someone's head. Absolutely, yeah. uh, exactly. It's a, it's a very high profit, low risk criminal yeah. enterprise, and all of these criminal groups, the, the all organised crime groups from around the world, are looking at ways to make a lot of money um, with a very low risk and cyber crime, crypto crime. Um, financial crime of some sort, Ponzi schemes, initial public offerings of you know a new crypto coin, whatever it may be, um, is is an is a is a way to make an enormous amount of money. And some of the uh, characters that are behind some of these big organisations that are on the mm. public face have um, well-known identities backing them. Yeah. But behind the scenes of some of these big, um, uh, you know crypto um, schemes that, that are launched. You see them come out all the time. You see them crashing all the time. Um, sometimes what's lurking behind these organizations is is very well 
uh, funded and well set up organized criminal groups um, from various parts of the world yeah. that are actually running it. Well, I, I think it is something that uh, we really need to uh, – and I, I talk we uh, – sometimes I say we, I'm still thinking as a, as a police officer – that uh, the changes, we need to stay ahead of it. We, yeah. we need to – and quite often the, the barrier could be someone like myself going, oh, you don't have to worry about that. I remember when Facebook first came in. I'm looking for someone and some young – detective would walk in the office and go, I think they live here, there, and I'm thinking, how, how have you found, found this out? Oh, I just looked it up on uh, uh, Facebook, sir. Here, what's Facebook? That mm. type of thing. But we're, we've all got to uh, got to change, change uh, with the times. Uh, absolutely, and, and it's, it's, the reality is that um, you know, all criminal activity uh, requires funding. You know, yep. uh, what, however that funding is raised um, will depend on the type of crimes, the type of criminals. Um, but but everyone or everyone in the criminal world wants to make money the easiest way. Well, that, that's organised organised crime, whether it be bikey groups or other forms of organised crime. The whole thing is about making money. About making money. And uh, you know, if they can't make money in drugs, if we crack down on drugs, where else can we make money? We go go the fraud. And look it. at the punishment for uh, for drugs, uh, uh, you know, commercial quantity drugs. You, you go to jail for a very long time, mm. but you can rip people off with uh, fraud. And uh, okay, well, it's a it's still thought of as a white collar type crime. There's no real victims. It hasn't been violent. But you think how you would feel. If you you lost all your life savings, your superannuation, your retirement's just taken away from you, and that's what's happening to people. Yeah, there's a general feeling um, that that victims uh, are to blame, um, uh, you know, for engaging in some investment scheme overseas, uh, you know, and there's a, there's a, that's the general feeling um, by police when a victim yeah. goes, uh, you know, I've been scammed out of this and. You know, it's it's just that general sense of well, why did they engage in this? There's obviously a risk. You haven't done due diligence. You know, this is the type of. Thing. I I think you hit the nail on the head. The people that do fall for these schemes are the ones that have lived a decent life and uh, don't see evil in everyone that uh, they speak to. Honest people. I know my mum without giving my mum's name or details away. She got a phone call from someone that uh, yeah started. Uh, oh, we need this details this details and uh, she provided to them and uh, my sister and uh, myself the other brother sorted some stuff out but she said that they were very nice yeah and that's uh, and I'm not uh, I'm not critical of my mother but it's someone that she wouldn't expect mm. that would be that evil that could uh, go down go down that path and they're the type of people that become victims to uh, to these uh and these crime groups um, that have developed call centres and they they understand that psychology now. Yep. That that if someone's um, honest, um, and, and Australia, you know, we we have a um, a good culture. It's a great country. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot of hardworking, honest people in this country, and uh, they're they're the perfect victims. To go after because they trust people. Yes, yeah. and uh, so they use that that psychology to uh, to cold call Australians and uh, get them on the on the hook. And it's all about being nice. And even some of the victims, we got a, a lady at the moment. She's eighty. Yeah, she's just lost her life savings, or everything, yeah. and she was devastated. Yeah, and she just said, "I still cannot believe. I, I thought this person that was calling from Europe um, with a heavy European accent." was so nice to her, you know, and yeah. helped her with all this crypto trading and it was just so nice to her over a period of like six months. Yeah, so but, that, that's a long, long plan. But he's taken now a million dollars of her money. So that six Poor months thing. relationship yeah. um, has cost her a million dollars because he was just a fraudster. He wasn't who he yeah. said he was. He was getting her to trade on a platform that was fraudulent. They're predators pl uh, preying on the vulnerable. And, it's a predator. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a predator. That's exactly what they are. Yeah. They're predators. Yeah. Disgusting. Yeah. All right. Uh, talking. Uh, talking fraudsters. I think we can say that. Peter Foster, convicted fraudster. Okay. We're we're, we're on. We're on safe. I think that's on record. Okay. We're on uh, on safe ground. Yeah. Tell me about your dealings with with him. First of all, how you became involved in investigating his activities and uh, all the other things that played out, including yeah. the uh, death threats. Uh, yeah, look, it's I've had a long history. Well, ten years, I guess. I've I've had a ten year history with uh, investigating Peter Foster. Originally, 
it, I got contracted by um, by by Nine Network, a, a current affair. Just before you go on, Ken, yeah. how would people identify with um, Peter Foster because he pops up in so many things? What's his history that people? I'm sure you show a photo, everyone will know him. You mention the name, they'll know him. Where do we know him from? Oh, he's Australia's greatest con man. Yeah, um, by far, he's been in the media for thirty years. He's yep. been involved in a lot of um, scandals, particularly weight loss scandals. Yeah. Um, Census Sh- Slim. Sheree Blair. Sheree Blair. Well, the, the Prime Minister's wife. The, the Sherry Gate scandal. Yep. Um, you know, he's he's a person who has made a, a criminal career out of out of defrauding people. Yeah. And that's how he makes his money, um, by by fraud, yep. by by creating an, a dream that that someone wants to to buy into. Yeah. Um, and that's how he's built his career. So um, he went from slimming products, which made millions um, in his earlier days. Yeah. He, he ended up moving across to sports betting, online sports betting. Right. What a perfect way to make money yeah. um, in, a, in a type of gambling operation where people that invest are taking a risk. Yeah. So he, he, he developed this um, sports betting um, company, uh, Sport, this idea of running these sports betting um, scams uh, using websites and uh, his first couple of attempts were were pretty pathetic. He, he, the first one that he's that he launched um, is the one that we uncovered a company called Sportalist, which um, which got shut down. It was exposed on a current affair. Yeah, I was involved in, in investigating that. Yep, um, linked it back to him. So who, who sorry uh, now who engaged you? So we, we, so Channel Nine. Yeah, okay. A, a current affair. Um, they were doing a story. In fact, I hooked up with Justin Armsden, who um, I have been working alongside now for a decade. Yeah. Um, Justin was the investigative reporter. He was the um, you know the bulldog from the media yep. that was wanting always chasing Peter Foster stories. Yep. So Justin uh, was the one that engaged me initially. Um, Justin's played a big part in all of my my cases with Foster, um, uh, which has now turned into an international podcast. Uh, um, but but he engaged me initially. If he didn't didn't exist, you'd have uh, to invent him. That's it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and initially, it was just me doing some basic investigations, and it wasn't until the sports betting club um, case that I guess um, I was publicly exposed as being the one that had him arrested. He he went on the run. Yeah, he did this big scam called Sports Trading Club. He made made millions out of it. Um, he he scammed about. Uh, 350 people um, around Australia altogether. Um, about 165 of those people ended up engaging me um, and my company to to try to get their money back yeah. from in the scam. But what had happened is he went on the run. He had a warrant out for his arrest. This is um, back in uh, 2014. He was he was a fugitive. He had an Interpol red notice. Yep. Um, he had failed to appear in the federal court in Brisbane. And uh, a warrant of arrest was issued, and he was a fugitive, and no one could find him. And then a recording surfaced uh, from a victim who had been scammed by Sports Training Club. Yeah. And that voice um, uh, recording was uh, given to Channel Nine, and someone had said, "Look, I, I believe this is Peter Foster. I heard that voice, um, uh, and I said it is definitely Peter Foster yeah. using a fake name." Right. Oh. Um, and what happened from there is uh, I then um, was tasked with the job from Channel 9 to track him down. Uh, he's wanted, got a, got a red notice, um, police couldn't find him, so let's track down the man, th- this voice. Um, and Without giving away methodology, but I, I know people will be wanting me to say, how did you track him down? Uh, yeah, look, look, very, very interesting story. Um, and, and of course, there's things I, I can't. I, I tapped into some pretty powerful resources internationally um, in order to get um, a, a fix on his location. Let's just say yep. that um, using resources offshore, not even in Australia. Yeah. Um, connections I had um, in the intelligence community um, using using various different methods to to track him. Um, I was able to put his family under surveillance. Um, where we really got the lucky break was 
following uh, putting surveillance on his mother because we knew that he had a close relationship with his mum. Yeah. And we knew that at some stage the mother would have to go and see him. And sure enough, one day, um, I think it was the third week that we were on the job, um, she gets picked up from her uh, Paradise Point mansion uh, in a black car with dark windows and uh, gets driven down to Byron Bay. Right. Now, we already had him located or what we call geolocated, um, electronically located. We already had him in this area because we had the phone number that he was using, the mobile number. So we knew that that mobile number was uh, in that area somewhere within about a one kilometer radius. So we had the general location. But once we followed the, um, the vehicle that came, uh, that picked up the mother, we knew at that point that we, that, that we, we, and that's one of those times where you cannot lose this car because we know it's going to take us straight to him. Yeah. And it did. It went into Magnolia Place in uh, Ewansdale near Byron Bay. And of course, uh, within a matter of hours, we're in the bushes with the army greens and, you know, because it was sort of out of, it was a semi-rural location. Um, we went in there that night. We, we had a look around the house. We noticed there was infrared CCTV everywhere. There was lasers across the driveway. Uh, he had a big security setup. Um, so we, 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 we mapped out all the security and, and the cameras and uh, we looked at all of the countermeasures that he'd put in place. Yep. Um, and then the next morning we were lying at the back of the house in, in a certain location where there were no cameras pointing. And uh, within within an hour or something, he was walking out, had a big bushy beard, long hair. Uh, you know, he's overweight. Yep. I mean, it, 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 but straight away I recognised him. I had another operative in the bush, recognised him as Peter Foster, got in touch with Byron Detectives, um, said, we've got a job for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, they jumped all over it. Yep. Um, and uh, I think it was... The next day, uh, they they came out to uh, to do the arrest. Um, we had a surveillance, a surveillance team in the bushes, and um, and, and the Byron, Byron police came out. They they drove in. Um, the uh, news crew, the, well, Justin Armsen's crew, he decided to run in first, um, which the police were very upset about. Yeah, uh, but he ran in first with the film crew, ran to the back of the house. Peter Foster sees sees him and runs out of the house, takes off up the up the side of the house uh, along the back yard, and and straight across into the neighbour's yard and runs smack into a barbed wire fence, bang, and he's flat on his back, cuts all over him. Yeah. He's he's down. Six detectives jump on him. There's a huge wrestling uh, match. You know he grabs the cop's gun, right. grabs the grabs the yeah. gun, won't let go of it. Um, struggling, the shirts ripped off the detective. You know, it's 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 a real scene. I was standing there taking a film. I was filming it all on my iPhone. Yeah. So I got all the footage, all the arrest footage. The crew's running around the house because they thought he was in the house, um, but he was up in the bushes. And uh, of course, it was the most you know uh, dramatic dramatic arrest. Yeah. Uh, rolling around in the dirt and you know losing his shorts almost. Um, it was pretty humiliating. Yeah. Um, and then uh, he got up and went to the house, drank water, and then all of a sudden comes the fake heart attack. You know, I'm having a heart attack. I can't breathe. You know, of course, so he gets taken away in an ambulance because he was very determined that he wasn't going to get taken away in a police yeah, car. I've, I've arrested a, a, quite a few of the uh, fake heart, the fake, heart uh, attacks. So, so he was off in the ambulance, and you know that that was my first uh, experience yeah. um, with, with him. And of course, I was interviewed on a current affair about the arrest and about the scam and so forth. And that, that then um, morphed into a very large investigation. Yep. Um, we've, we filed a class action in the Supreme Court of New South Wales um, against 12 defendants. Um, we seized and froze um, almost $10 million in bank accounts overseas in the Cayman Islands, Hong Kong and Vanuatu. It's a big scale, isn't it? Yeah, we, got, we, got, we clawed all that money back, less a lot of expenses. A lot of legal fees. We had to get a litigation funder. Um, the money was burned up. You know, by the time it got back to the lawyers here, yeah. there was only a couple of million dollars left. Um, ultimately, we won the case. Uh, there was a judgment, 
um, against Foster, which mm. still exists. Um, but um, but uh, all the money got used up in legal fees. So yeah. so the, it was a, a bittersweet ending for the yeah. victims who got nothing. Um, no justice at yeah, all. Yeah, that's, that's a shame of it all, isn't it? Yeah, no justice. So so during the time when I was freezing all his bank accounts, he was in jail because yeah. he, he'd gone to prison. For, but he only served a year. He got a he got eighteen months, but he got six months off his sentence because he he ratted on um, someone in prison uh, yeah. in, in relation to a, a murder. It was the John Charden case. This is public. Right. It's in the newspapers. Um, he. He essentially became a witness in that case, yeah. um, and said he had information. Became a police witness, so he did a deal, manipulated the the system again. Yeah, um, got six months off his sentence for, for for testifying against John Charden. Never ended up testifying at all. Never ended up. Never saw the the courtroom. Yeah, but he got his six months off. So he came out after a year, um, and. I could just imagine that he would have straight away gone to log on to all these accounts and all the money's gone, all the money's been taken, all yeah. the accounts are seized. Um, and at that point, uh, I knew because I had sources, uh, various different sources that were um, in his, um, you know, in his, in his um, not, not in his house, but I had sources that were very close to in him. In his circle. In his circle, yeah. that's it. I had, had had very good sources in his circle, um, and uh, he he was so uh, devastated by the loss of, of, of that that ten million dollars that he decided to um, start making plans to get me killed. And he, those plans were it's not just in his um, thinking about. He actually started. He he started taking active steps, and this has all been publicised. Yep. Um, uh, he started m taking active steps. He I was in the Philippines, living there. Yep. Um, he started contacting um, criminal associates in the Philippines um, that were um, that were in the Philippines uh, that were from Australia. They were Australians in the criminal world. Yeah. Um, what he underestimated was that I also had a lot of connections in the criminal world because in my job, I, I have a lot of sources, yeah. informants, confidential informants, people who cooperate. And so it fil filtered back to you. So it filtered back to me that he was making these arrangements. His record, his voice, uh, the the calls got recorded. Yeah. Of him making the plans, shopping around. When can I get it done? You know, all of this is recorded. Yeah. And uh, he was a absolutely adamant that he wanted me gone before Christmas of 2015. He was going to give you a bonus uh, or give the uh, perpetrator a bonus, a bonus to absolutely. get you done before Christmas. Absolutely. There was a, I think an $80,000 bonus or a $100,000 bonus. I think it was $80,000 was the price. Yeah. But he put another 100000 on it if it could be done before Christmas. Right. <laughs> um, he was planning to have the, the money, uh, you know, sent to the Philippines somehow. Yeah. Probably organising for someone to carry it. Yeah, um, he was at that point in time highly motivated mm. to uh, to have me knocked off. But I was one step ahead. Yeah, um, I was on to him um, within a matter of days. I was back on the Gold Coast. I had surveillance on him. Yeah, um, I liaised with the Gold Coast Police at that point in time. Um, unfortunately, they they never charged him. Right. For the procuring a murder because of jurisdictional problems. Okay. Because of witness issues, um, because of the anti wiretapping law in the Philippines. Yeah. Can't record conversations. Yeah. You know, all of that. So there was all these um, problems with getting a prosecution, although the, D the DPP or the public prosecutor in, uh, in Brisbane was willing to give it a shot. Yeah. Uh, they were, they were going to run it. They were going to run it. They were willing to give it a go. But there was just some jurisdictional problems that they thought might uh, might not be successful okay. for the prosecution, even though they had these. I think the recordings themselves were very compelling, and and can be identified but by experts as his voice. They were wondering whether they could get them in, admiss, admissible. admissible. In, that was the, the, the concern because yeah. they were illegally recorded in the Philippines. Yeah, um, you know. So, so, so there was this kind of big legal fight about yeah. whether or not he can be prosecuted, and, you know. And I was hoping that he would get charged, of course. Um, but 
uh, at that stage, he had already started a new scam. Yeah. Started setting up a new scam. Um, There's uh, no shame in him. Is no, it? no, no. That's and he had, you know, he had a lot of people, a lot of hangers on. Yeah. A lot of people that would do things for him to this day. Yeah. Um, that's why he's able to escape custody and hide because he has people, a lot of old school um, criminal associates, not even criminals. Some of these people are not even criminals. They're, they're normal people that, yeah. are, that, are, that, that have this desire to want to help him. Yeah. Because he's such a, a charming character. Everyone says got, he's such a charming character. Got the, the charisma. I've got the charisma, yeah. and that's what a good con man is all about. Yeah. So, so he's um, he. There was another part to it because wasn't there a, a arrest at Port Douglas? Uh, that was the third arrest. Yeah, uh, he got arrested for the sports trading. And club. you happened to be there again. And the the third time uh, was Port Douglas, and. Yep. Uh, he um, he had um, been accused of uh, being involved in this million dollar scam, and uh, which I'm investigating, and that's before the court. So obviously, that is one that I, I I can't say too much about. But what what I can talk about is the the fact that um, I again he vanished um, from the Gold Coast. Yeah, um, I think he got wind of the fact that I was onto him. Um, unfortunately for him, the victim that he targeted, so he stopped targeting Australian victims. Yeah. He targeted a guy in Greece. <laughs> yeah. So the guy in Greece just happened to be in Singapore visiting a friend and said, I've just lost a million dollars and uh, you know, from this uh, this scam and it's run by these people in Australia and rah, rah, rah. Well, it just so happens that the guy sitting at the table in Singapore said, I know someone you could contact, this guy, this private investigator. Oh, right. Okay. So I get a Word phone call from the, the the guy in Greece who was in Hong Kong at the time. He's a, he's a Greek-American ex-fighter pilot yeah. for the US um, Air Force. And uh, I get this call and uh, he says, oh, you know, I've been caught up in this scam. And I said, what's the name of it? And he told me. And I said, wow, I know all about it. I know who's involved. I, he said, I've got voice recordings. I said, Can you send me the voice recordings? So he sends the voice recordings. and uh, Sure enough. Yeah. It's it's the man of mystery. Okay. Um, so so I realized at that point, I've got him again. Um, and then I pushed to, um, I, I pushed then to file complaints and put a brief together yeah. and so forth. And, uh, you know, um, uh, New South, well, New South Wales Police, because there was a jurisdiction uh, here because of the uh, crypto that travelled through the local crypto exchange in Sydney. Yeah, um, it, it, that gave jurisdiction for an offence in New South Wales. Right, according to the law, anyway. Um, but that subsequently failed ultimately. But the New South Wales Police were able to issue an arrest warrant for him. Yeah. And I was able to, uh, once that arrest warrant was issued, I had already locked onto him um, starting on the Gold Coast. Um, within a matter of days, I traced him to Port Douglas up in North Queensland. Yeah. Uh, he was planning to buy a million dollar yacht to sail the seven seas. He was going to escape. <laughs> Why not? Yeah. And I went up there. I bought an agent, um, one of my agents from South Australia up. On the job, Agent X, who remains anonymous to this day, yeah, um, and we staked him out day after day after day, and we followed him and followed him and followed him. Learned his patterns. Uh, we found his location where he's living. Um, we saw him walking the dog on a daily basis. We started to map it all out, and then when the warrant of arrest was finally issued, I liaised with the Cairns um, Major Crime Squad. Yep. I went and had a meeting with them, talked about what you know what my intentions were, um, talked about having media present because yep. that was a big issue that yep. became a, the subject of a big internal investigation. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I told the detective that uh, he actually asked me, Do you, are you going to have any cameras uh, you know, or media? And I said, well, that depends on how you feel about that. Um, if, if it's no problem, I, I would like to have media with me. Um, if you oppose that, I'm not going to do anything to jeopardise the operation. 
Yeah. And he said, we don't care as long as you don't get in our way. As long as you stay out of the, you know, we don't care, you know, br bring cameras, whatever. Um, and that was what happened. Yeah. So we then f f went and planned the arrest day. I liaised closely with the detectives up there and we knew his pattern. Um, we had intelligence that he was armed with a handgun. Right. Which turned out to be absolutely accurate, but it was a replica. Okay. But he was, he'd had a handgun. Um, that was seized from the house by the police. Yep. And uh, we planned the operation. We, we strategically planned how we would film the arrest, um, how we would do it in a way that didn't interfere with the police, uh, where they would be situated. We, we kind of helped them to, to map it out because we had a month of training. Uh, watching his, uh, under his our patterns. Belt, and, uh, watching yep. the patterns. Yep. So we, we then moved in. Um, luckily... We got lucky on the day because uh, my my cameraman happened to be on one end of the beach. The the, the way that he was walking, yeah. the sixty minutes came from the back. We also had a drone in the air just to just to yeah. get a, a little bit of a three dimensional view of the arrest, um, and everything just fell into place. Yeah, and it was it, my cameraman filmed the takedown. Yeah. Um, Actually, it was a camera woman, but uh, but filmed the takedown. Um, the rest is is history. We we successfully arrested him. Yep. Um, the police did, um, and yeah, I was present. He the first time he'd ever spoken to me directly to my face. He looked up. He had his face in the sand, um, ha being handcuffed by these very fit detectives yeah. that jogged down the beach, pretending to be joggers. And they crash tackled him on the sand, thinking that he could be armed. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's why they tackled him in that manner. Um, and uh, of course, uh, you know, he looks up and uh, sees me, and uh, just says, "Can gamble." <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he said it with like a term of endearment. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> that's, um... no. It was. I think at that point. Um, he, the realization that that I was not going to go away, yeah. um, set in, and and um, we were all over him, all over everything he was doing. We, we, we were, but you need you do need that type of tenacity to go after absolutely. after uh, after people sometimes. Absolutely. And uh, yeah. you know, taking it back, where say about making it personal or, or too much passion, you can do it. You've got to have perspective, and uh, you. You were engaged to find him. Yeah, you're. you're um, I think you've described, uh, or you've been described as a gun for hire in the type of work that you do. Mm. And that's not saying that in a, a nasty no, sense or no. a dramatic sense, but that that's your job. People that's right. people are paying you to find out. Paying to, me to find someone. Yeah. Paying me to track their location uh, to assist the police to arrest someone. Yeah, yeah. We do it. We do it all the time. Yeah. Um, uh, I and I. I Good on you for yeah. doing it because if it's not done, the other people will will suffer. Yeah, well, people suffered as a result of that because yeah. uh, you know certain detectives were suspended and uh, have now stepped out of the police force because of that arrest. Um, so right. you know that's unfortunate. Oh, I, I didn't didn't realise that. That's a, that's a that's a shame. But, there was uh, a major but... internal investigation because of you know because why were the media present at this arrest? So you know that sort of thing is. Yeah. Let me tell you, Ken, they won't be the first police to uh, leave the police force in, let's say, controversial circumstances. Exactly, that's right. <laughs> just that's a, it. It's the na nature of it. Yeah. Um, a, another one, and I, I'm just mindful of uh, how, how how many things we've got to talk about, and we're not going to get through them all, but another one I want to talk about is uh, the uh, Belgium backpacker up at Byron Bay because yeah. I, I think, again, just people that mightn't be aware of it, um, how, how old was he at... Uh, how old was Theo? Uh, yeah, Theo. So um, eighteen. Eight, eighteen. Eighteen. He'd he'd been out for a night on Byron Bay. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, he was asked to leave a nightclub yep. and left, and that's the last he's been. Yeah, he just arrived in town a couple of days earlier. Um, he'd been out uh, that, earlier that night with another Belgian friend that he'd met yep. at the Backpackers. Went out to the Cheeky Monkey nightclub. Yeah. Um, during the evening, he was asked to to leave. Um, he, he was had, had a few beers, uh, having a great time. Um, the bar staff thought he was intoxicated, so they asked him to to, to leave the club. So yeah. he's basically booted out. Yeah. 
Um, he then wandered off. He was on his phone, um, wandered off and never seen again. Um, he was. He went down to a location around the corner, down near some cricket nets. He stayed there for six minutes. Um, that, that's all. That all later came out with his GPS on his phone. Um, he left a trail, a GP, a very detailed trail of what he did. He, he walked down through a park, up through the back streets, and across down in this very um, dark and ominous area mm. um, between the Byron Bay Township and Tallow Beach. Yeah, I wouldn't go down there at night. Yeah, I, I know the I, I know the area well. It's not the type of place that you would, uh, would no, go to. No, and he was going pretty briskly you know he was walking because the speed of his walk was even recorded on on the gps yeah. so so there was quite incredible um, tr tracking available and um, uh, and he vanished um there was certain activities on his phone about 1 a.m uh, something happened um mm. and as a result there was no more uh, activity on his phone but his phone remained connected to the tower right through um until early in the afternoon of the next day. Yeah. It was still pinging the tower in that location, general location. Now, there's a thought, because there was a search, his body hasn't been located, and there, were, there was a thought that uh, he, uh, well, fell into the water, basically. And yep. that's why his body hasn't been, been recovered. That's concerning. And I, I say this from uh, without knowing the intricate details of the investigation, but my uh, my belief was any time there's a suspicious disappearance or death, it should be treated as suspicious until it can be proven otherwise. Mm. I think some assumptions were made that uh, he's just, that's what's happened to him. But your involvement, how, how did you become involved in it to start with? So I was um, originally asked um, to comment on uh, on some Google data yep. uh, on the Lighthouse podcast, yep. um, which, which uh, the Australian newspaper was doing in relation to the case. And I, as a result of the comments that I made, um, I was asked to look into this data a little bit further. Yeah. And, I, and I actually offered, I said, if there's anything I can do to help, I've had a lot of experience looking at Google data. Um, we have geospatial consultants, you know, we, we know a lot about data and how it works. So um, that I then got introduced to the family uh, and, and I said, I'm happy to help out um, and look at this data. Yeah. Originally, that's how it started. And then when I started to look into the data and f make all these discoveries and, and, and look at the line of inquiry that the police were going down, hmm. I became very concerned um, that, that they were on the wrong track, that the yeah. police were not on the right track. Um, they hadn't even accessed this data initially. Um, this was found by the family, this data. Yeah. Um, so I I um, contacted Byron Bay Detective. Well, before that, I I um, offered to help the family pro bono. I said, look, I'm happy to help. Yeah. Um, I didn't realise at that point the extent of what I'd be doing. Um, initially, I just said I'm happy to to, to help out with, with whatever I can. I got a formal engagement letter from the parents in Belgium. Yep. Um, to to be engaged, I made it very clear that I'm not going to charge anything. Yeah. I don't want to be seen to be commercially benefiting uh, from a case like this. Yeah, I, I understand no, what, I said, what you're saying. I can't charge, but yep. I will do everything I can to help. Um, so I said, I'll, I'll do it pro bono. I'll do whatever I can to help. I'll use my resources, my team. Um, and, and that's how it started. So once I had the, 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 the letter from the parents, I uh, contacted Byron detectives, and unfortunately, they wouldn't meet with me. They didn't want to meet me um, um, because I'd spoken on the podcast, I suppose. Um, at that stage, they were concerned about the growing media interest in this case. Mm. Um, uh, they, for whatever reason, um, rejected my invitation to have a meeting um, because at that point, I was starting to to gather some of my own information and data, and uh, I, I already had some ideas on how we could fully investigate. I've investigated hundreds of missing persons yeah. cases, so I had I had a lot of ideas about how we could map together his last movements, um, ways and means that maybe even the police might not have even thought of, particularly with the digital evidence. Um, but I was I was completely blocked from having the meeting to this day i've never met them yeah and look i'll i'll, I'll make a comment here and I, I don't want to be controversial i don't know the the details or the nature i'm hearing hearing what you're saying 
I'll, I'll make this in a general comment that uh, if I was heading up that investigation and someone with your skills and uh, yeah, experience came to me, I would meet with you and uh, and get the information. And I just I, I don't understand why why they wouldn't. It's, uh, we don't understand it either. Yeah. And, 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 and I, I know you're burnt because I, I don't, you know, my relationship's destroyed. I don't want to destroy your relationship with the police. I, I think you're genuine in that trying to help and that's, yeah, correct. that's what everyone's focus should uh, well, should be on. Well, I think what, what, it, what it, it sends a bad message to the family. I think that the bottom yeah. line, I'm a representative of the family. I've been officially appointed yes. to act for the family. Um, and if they reject a meeting with me, they're in fact rejecting... Um, the family trying to help. The family are trying to retain someone professionally yeah. to look in. We're not trying to tread on the police's toes. It's quite the opposite. We're actually wanting to work together in a collaborative way because what we've demonstrated through decades of doing this type of work is that some of the most successful investigations yeah. have been as a result of collaboration. 100%. Yeah. And if you, th there's many, many, many instances of cases that have been solved because of members of the public coming forward, right? Yeah. Um, I, I'm laughing because it's, it, it's a no-brainer. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. So why would you not open your arms up to anybody that comes to Byron Bay with certain skill sets? Yes. If you don't know anything about that person, look them up, do your homework, You know, make a phone call, yeah. whatever. Find out who is this person that wants to meet rather than take this approach of, no, we, we don't want to associate or mix or meet anybody outside of our office. Um, yeah. And that has cast a dark shadow on this investigation from day one, um, yeah. to be honest. Um, there's a lot of people unhappy about it, Yep. Um, about the way in which it was. there's been a recent um, coronial in inquest. Yeah. Uh, so it's not me. I don't have to say anything. I just listen to the inquest and uh, you'll, you'll hear all the criticism. Um, yeah, and and why not uh, why not take up uh, take up those uh, that offer to help and and some of the stuff because I've seen what uh, some of the data that you uh, you found and it does call into question uh, the theory that he's just uh, fallen off the uh, off the cliff. Absolutely, there, there were there were other lines of inquiry um, that were, were very strong, and in fact the the information that uh, that came the anonymous information that came to light which resulted in the in the program on on uh, on nine network yeah um, was very compelling very very compelling information but it was it was disregarded because the people that said this information uh, had histories of drug use and uh, criminal yeah. records well well i shouldn't have to tell any detective that but but Drug users and criminals can witness a crime. Yeah, um, yeah. Regardless of the credibility, that's that's a different issue. But they can still witness a very serious crime. Yeah. And they should be given every benefit of the the doubt. And and if they can receive, retain, and relay, and then you can work out how much weight you place on that evidence when it's married up with all the other evidence. Correct. But, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we went down this line of inquiry, which opened up a can of worms, and we were told information uh, by people connected to this individual that made this so-called confession, um, one of his relatives tells us uh, some information. As a result of that information, we drive 70 kilometres away to mm. Nimbin, yep. to a, an abandoned house, and we make an, an unbelievable discovery of the belongings of a deceased person right. who happens to have been found at Tallow Beach, right. the same location that Theo disappeared. So there was something really, really compelling about that information, yeah. And how it was obtained, and the, why did the these people, why did these people know this information, and were able to lead us to that house, and we made this compelling find of, of the, all of the personal belongings of Thea Little, um, who was found deceased yeah. in, in Tallow Beach, in the exact area where Theo disappeared. Yeah, same area. Um, her death was not treated as suspicious. Um, but it's, there's a lot of people that would argue about that. Yeah, it, it's concerning, isn't it? And the impact that it has on the family, if the family doesn't have the confidence and the community doesn't have the confidence that everything that can be done is being done, that, that's a that's something that they carry with for the rest of their lives, the frustration. Absolutely, and, absolutely. Uh, what yeah. I know about homicide investigations or missing persons, sometimes you can't get the successful outcome, but you give 
the family some comfort if you know everything that can be done has been done and the frustration that they must feel with engaging you and then not communicating, not uh, you know, handing over all your information or, or talking talking about that. But, uh, you know, I hope, and just listening to you, and it, it makes me realise how many things are changing in, in the world of crime mm. and you've got to stay on top of it and uh, hopefully the uh, the police are going to embrace it and uh, understand the need to change change our thinking yeah absolutely and um you know uh, the, the thing is that organizations like like us like, yeah. like ifw global uh, we, we're out there doing this on a global basis we're, we're not just here new south wales a very a fraction of our work is, is based here yeah. even in australia now um, so we're collecting intelligence, an enormous amount of intelligence. I mean, we share our intel with the FBI, yep. um, who are blown away at the amount of intelligence that we've collected over the past decade in relation to large-scale financial crime groups all over the planet, from South Africa to Bulgaria to Ukraine to Turkey. You know, we've got all the groups identified. Um, we know who the, the kingpins are, the masterminds. Mm. We know the rego plates of their cars. We know what private jets they're flying. Um, this is high-level intel that nobody has except us. Yeah. So why wouldn't the some of these agencies reach out and want to know that? Um, yeah. I know that the FBI d do, and I know that Homeland Security investigations do. Uh, some of these bigger agencies that take it seriously yeah. um, are craving for that sort of intel. And yet we, we have an enormous amount of that uh, that we... Uh, you know, we, we have shared intel yeah. with our law enforcement here, but there's not a strong sense of the importance of that. Yeah, it's almost like it, it, it sounds childish, but it's like a demarcation dispute. No, that's this is our world. Yeah. You, you stay out of it. But uh, it's not as if you're a fly by night group. Like you've, um, and I've, I've run out of time, but with Sri Lanka, um, you met with the Sri Lankan president on, on two occasions, but that was uh, helped investigate uh, a fraud that was uh, costing billions of dollars. Yeah, look, uh, the embezzlement of, of five plus billion dollars from the by the former president the, yep. the allegations of the president embezzling the money and we got uh, engaged by the the financial crime police to um, consult um, to the Sri Lankan government um, through my intelligence sources in Sri Lanka yeah we got an introduction uh, went to Singapore had a meeting with the chief of the financial crimes police um, then ended up in in uh, in in Colombo um, um, and and then uh, meeting with President Sirisena face to face and that was one of those moments where you pinch yourself and you think wow um that we'll talk about one extreme to the other you know um it was it, we went to the the, the presidential palace uh, we met him on two separate occasions yeah um this is around 2017 um and we we were able to have a one hour face to face discussion about the methodology that we were intending to use to track assets all across the world. Wow. That was what it was about. Okay. Asset recovery, asset discovery. Um, and we gave, you know, what we thought needed to happen in order to track all these assets and how we were going to freeze assets and what lawyers were going to use in Hong Kong. And, you know, we, we gave them an insight about it. And we started the investigation. Yeah. We spent a number of days in workshops. Um, and ended up having a second meeting with the president. Funny enough, uh, at the end of the meeting, I was thinking, I want to pull my camera out and ask for a photo, but that's really uncool because I'm sitting with the president. Yeah. Um, but luckily for, for me, he he turns around and pulls the camera and he, he says, come on, let's get a photo. Now that's cool. <laughs> and here we are, we get our photo with President Sirisena, yeah. which was kind of pretty cool. Yeah. Um, uh, it was a nice memento to to take back um, home, you know. Uh, yeah. But that that just shows the, um, I guess the the enormous reach of someone in our industry. Yeah. Um, it's not the first government that I've worked for. Yeah. Foreign government. Um, there are foreign governments that hire people like us to find assets, tax cheats, people who yeah. are cheating certain countries' tax systems and have gone overseas and hidden assets. They can't go through official channels to get that information. Yeah. They have to hire private professionals. Yeah. Um, and, and there's a huge industry in, in that. So, um, you know, our clients can go all the way to the top, yeah. uh, which which I, I find exciting. And, um, 
uh, it, it, it just it makes you feel great about what you do, um, that we can help, you know, governments, not well, just I, people. Well, I, I do get the sense in, in talking to you, and I think it, it's come across to the listeners uh, listening to the podcast, that uh, you do like to help. It's not all about, uh, well, this is my business, this is what I do. There's, there's things that you're, you're reaching out to help because you've got all this, uh, this um, knowledge and experience and skills, mm. access to uh, things that, uh, yeah, traditional law enforcement doesn't have and you, you're willing to help. So, yeah, hopefully we do start to look at things a little bit differently. As the, the face of crime is starting to change, maybe the way we fight it, we've got to change that as well. Yeah, so. absolutely. And and that'll just, in, in, you know, it'll continue to evolve as we move forward in the technological age. Yeah. Um, we are fighting a, a, a new enemy when it comes to crime. Yeah. Um, and, and of course, the online aspect of crime is now, has now taken over. So we, we, we might have, it's not like passing a dud check that you walk into the local police station. No, and, those and, days are gone. Yeah. They were simpler days, weren't they? Absolutely. They were, were uh, definitely. And uh, when you look at how much it's changed, and uh, there's a, a, a quote, and I'll, I'll just rush it through, but uh, another quote that you've said about the changing face of crime. So, and this is talking about your, your career. Uh, when you started. There was no internet, no mobile phones, very little tracking technology and not even much CCTV around the community. I've witnessed a global transformation during my career from one extreme to another, the growth of digital media, the expansion of the internet, an explosion in technology-based crimes, incredible tracking technology, facial recognition and now the prolific growth of cryptocurrency scams across the world. Mm. Just that's, about sums up. <laughs> that sums it all up. I yeah. mean, I, I've been lucky enough to live in a 30-year period of time where there's been the most dramatic change in the history of uh, the world. Yeah. The most dramatic change from one extra, from, from the old way to the new way. And it's all occurred in the past 30 years. Yeah. And, and it'll continue to, to change, but not as dramatically as it has in the last 30 years. So it's, 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 it was a great time for me to serve in my industry. Yeah. Well, you, you have served and uh, quite often when I have a police officer here, I, I thank them for their service and service to the community. And uh, I have no problem saying that to you, even you're running a private business, but uh, you have served the community and you, you're making a difference. So you, as a uh, law enforcement agent, officer, whatever you want to call yourself, you can't hope for doing anything more than uh, helping people that uh, yeah have been uh, been wronged. That's it. And and if I leave any legacy in the world, I, I want to be able to change uh, the way that the particularly financial crime um, is investigated. And and you know if I can save thousands or even millions of people from financial ruin. I think that's a good legacy. That's a great, great legacy. Now you've also got to write a book at some stage because I, I think <laughs> I, I think you've got some absolutely amazing stories, and you've you've told me a couple of uh, cases you worked off off record, and that sounds like if it if it didn't happen, you'd have to invent it. So that's right. Yeah. It's, um, it's time. It takes time to write a book. <laughs> it, it, it does. I'm, I'm sure at the end of your end of your career, you might be able to sit down and uh, put put some time into it. But uh, a fascinating career that you've had, and I know how busy you are. Always busy. And uh, thanks for making the time to uh, come on uh, iCatch Killers. My pleasure. Absolutely. Cheers, yeah. Ken. Thank you. <laughs>